Hey all, this is Eric, Channel Ops RC. I um, had the bright idea to kind of share some of the stuff I went out through when I was in the Army. Um, big salute to Pilot Robert over in Slovenia. Recently just um, almost cut his hand off. Wish him speedy recovery. So everybody definitely go check him and his brother out. It's Captain Robert, uh, sorry, Pilot Robert and Captain Blaws. They do things real similar to Pat or and Captain Mike. Their own uh, spin. They don't edit. They don't do any of that stuff. So I do things similarly. I don't edit the actual video itself. I won't this either. I just add music or titles. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. I won't give you my last name, even though most of you guys know it. Um, I went to the National, Army National Guard in 2009. I needed a job. Um, I scored extremely high on my ASVAB to get a job called 15 Whiskey. What that is is a UAV operator in the Army. So, I went to basic training in 2009. Uh, November 2009 to the end of February 2010 and then from then the end of boot camp till September I was in flight school for UAV training I was trained how to fly and operate the camera um, seems not complicated but it really is um, so it's more like RC which is what I do. So, um, UAVs do um, follow the exact same guidelines as manned aviation. So, you do your daily inspections, your weekly inspections, uh, flight hours inspections. So, um, at 500 flight hours when we were in country on each of our birds, just like manned aviation airplane, we totally dismantled the UAV, inspected everything, and put her back together. So, uh, just like Jeff on Jeff's Customs RC talked about and on a video off of his page yesterday, you might not have to just totally tear your bird apart. Of you're not going to get 500 flight hours with the aircraft, but you need to be able to do inspections. You need to take care of um, what you're doing, and you need to stay on top of it, too. I'll share some stories of people I was with that crashed UAVs, and we're talking something instead of, you know, like between average $100 to $1,000 that we as hobbyists fly to a million dollars plus. So it's a big loss in the military when you lose their drones slash UAVs. Now, I did not find the most expensive one, but a million dollars plus is a lot of money. And that's just advertised price. It's probably a lot more than that because we all know how the government operates and pays for things. So the first instance, uh, I flew the Shadow UAV. Um, uses a big launcher that folds onto a standard Humvee trailer to launch in the air. Um, has a little 35 horsepower, 28 pound rotary Wankel engine on it. Uh, this is one of the uh, propeller I actually flew. And as you can tell from the top here, it's kind of darker. That tells you it's been flown because uh, to save weight, I don't recycle the oil. It is an older design motor, so I can say it's very eco-friendly, but um, it would spit the oil out once it went through the crankcase on the output shaft from the motor. Um, and so that's why the leading edge is dark. Um, this one is special to me because if you look right here, this one was actually damaged on the mission. Now it wasn't combat fire or anything. Um, it was the, the suction from the prop sucked a rock up either on landing or 
take off more likely take off uh, landing because take off you're like 10 or 15 feet more or more in the air when it launches so um but these are just wood with a rubber nylon coating to keep water from making it come apart but uh so this gives you an idea of the size of the UAD actually 14 foot wingspan 11 feet long so but uh, so one particular day, um, you would never do this procedure in country or in the U.S. because it's um, something you really don't have to do. You don't rack up the flight hours that we do, and generally speaking, the engines last a long time. Now on Iraq, the fifty thousand dollar engine on a UAV. Thing on temperatures, especially in summer, we were lucky to get 55 hours out of the engine because the heat could be over 100 at 3,000 feet in the air. And mind you, it's air cold. So, um, what happened is we had two shifts to kind of offset. Uh, we weren't equipped to do 24 hours, so we had to try to offset because the unit we were supporting one 24 hours, but we weren't equipped to do it. So, we had our the day is split between two crews and uh, what happened is first crew which is day crew um, which is typically when I flew and when a lot of missions went on so I got a lot of flight time helping boots on the ground um, got a new motor needed to run it up make sure it was working right and uh, so the only way to do that really is to put on a launcher and lock the latch so it won't release. Um, one shift got going through it. Um, not that this procedure in itself is bad, but when you don't follow procedure or when you're in the middle of something when it comes to aviation and you don't hand off what you did to the next person that takes over, and I don't care if it's oh crap, enemy shooting at us, bad things happen. So the first crew, and this is a guy I mean I haven't seen in a long time, but I was friends with, got the bird ready, got distracted in the changeover, didn't lock the shuttle, the part that latches on the launcher, it's real similar to your aircraft carrier, just lots more stuff. Um didn't tell the crew coming off. So bad on him. Then the next maintainer that came on to go do the run up did not check his work. So with aviation, you should always assume something was not done unless it's in writing or the person physically shows you while they're doing it that they did it because the latch wasn't latched. And when the person in the sh uh, command center went to fire that engine up to full throttle, it had enough force to move the shuttle forward. And it's just a spring on the shuttle itself that holds the latch on the wings. When it went forward, there was enough jerk on the shuttle that it let go on the plane, so the plane slammed on the, on the um, launcher. Um, now, I don't agree how they reported it. That's another story. I deployed with a bunch of corrupt, uh, what's another word, corrupt ground noise leadership. Um, those, that's another story I don't want to run into. But basically, the plane should have told. It destroyed the wing. Our FSR, a field service rep, under command by our company commander, first antenna, uh, rebuilt the wing. Um, I don't know about you, but field service reps are just a more in-depth maintainer, not a builder, not a and in some cases, I don't even think they knew much more than the maintainers or myself. So, but, so basically, this plane was down. We had to fix it so we could do a mission. We couldn't wait for another wing. I understand that. 
I don't understand the decision that were made to not report it or anything because someone didn't want to get demoted or in trouble with someone to outrank them. Um, sorry, let me move on. So that's one story of where procedure on one side and procedure on another wasn't followed through, whether it was in writing or physically seen. One person didn't finish what they're doing, the next person didn't check to make sure they did everything they did. So one person got in trouble on that when it should have been at least two people because they both failed to do their job as a maintainer. And what we should do with our plans, because these, most of mine are full, and everybody else is full, 100 miles an hour, that's enough to hurt somebody or damage something. Look what happened to the space shuttle with the foam that flew off the tank at over uh, Mach 1. Um, the space shuttle Columbia. It hit a carbon carbon panel, which is extremely strong. Only weighed 50 pounds. And it put a hole at about the size of a basketball. And that's what brought down the shuttle Columbia on re-entry is because the hot gas went through the hole and melted the airframe. Um, so there's, even with RC, it's fun. I love it, you guys. You should love it, too. Please take it seriously. Um, it is, it's a responsibility. I think that's one of the reasons why they've come out with the new guidelines is there's been way too many people not taking it seriously, and now we're suffering for that. So that's another story. So second story is during pre-flight with the UAV, the shadow I flew, there's a couple emergency flight modes, so if you lose link with the control station, you, um, um, you're in a situation where you need to just glide the bird to the ground. Um, there's a couple other ones. It's been like 10 years, so sorry guys. If I saw the checklist, I could point right to it and know what to do, but, uh, uh, the one we used a lot was return home. You literally physically programmed it into the computer that if you lost link, the plane, if the engine was still running, would fly to that point and loiter until it ran out of gas or you picked um, control back up. So we had to stack so many missions in at a time when I was deployed, in this, especially second area, which was on the air border hellhole, if you ask me. So when one bird was getting ready to come in so we could land it, a lot of times a half hour before that, our launch site would pre-flight. So as soon as that bird landed, they could launch the other one. So we would have almost 20 hours of no breaks and coverage for the guys on the ground, including myself. Because I was on that base. We get shot at every day with rockets. So, um... Another guy that was one of my roommates, well deployed, and he uh, was pre flying the bird. Got in a hurry, got in a hurry, got in a hurry. Got to the point where there's a mode called glide mode. Uh, what that does is it puts the flaps full, it puts the camera in um, land mode, so it ends it forward at the front nose wheel. And one or two things. Are, can happen. What's supposed to happen, the engine is supposed to just go to idle. In this case, um, well, we'll get into that in a second. So he's programming that flight mode, then get started when he needed to, and all of a sudden he needed to land the bird. So there's a procedure you follow, just like the previous crash I told you about, that he did some and he didn't do some of it. And so basically when the radio link transferred to him, he was still in that command to go into glide mode where the flaps would go full, motor would go to idle, and camera, which was the expensive part, would go into that landing mode. Because the plane was descending when he took control, not only did the motor go to idle, but because it dropped the idle so quickly, it died. And you can guess what happened. That plane was destroyed. 
more decisions were made that were not ethical, not my call. I would not have made them. But it was not my call, not my responsibility. Plan was told. They had our field service rep fix it with the parts we had so we can maintain flying and not disappoint leadership here in Idaho who had no clue where we were at and the leadership we were supporting. Um, so there's a million dollar plus asset destroyed because getting in a hurry, regardless of if there's a checklist or not, you make sure you guys do create some sort of procedure. Please do that. Follow so that way things don't happen. So uh, the checklist wasn't followed. What he was doing was borderline. You know, I well, should be doing this with another bird in the air, but something we kind of had to do to maintain as much coverage as possible. The problem he ran into was being in too much of a hurry, complacent. Forgetting to refer back to the checklist because you have to match commands of the airplane that has control. Otherwise, when control is handed over, whatever mode you have the emergency mode in, the plane will go into that. So that's why the plane didn't do anything wrong. It did what he told it to, what he programmed it to. It was operator error and not following procedures and being complacent that he could do everything he wanted without looking at the checklist or following. Most accidents in land aviation are because of that. I guarantee most accidents with RC, even if it's just destroyed RC plane, are because of complacency, not checking yourself, if you're out with your buddies, not helping them remember to check things, um, that kind of thing. So that's kind of a sort of crappy stuff I dealt with. That's just the iceberg. So I would recommend you guys, as RC stuff, definitely, if you don't do logbooks, come up with some sort of procedure that you do to try to catch discrepancies with your equipment, whether that's radio, batteries, motor, or if it's gas or nitro, or like anything, so that way, um, when it's in the air, you have a high probability of landing. So, um, so one mission we were on, we were near a city in Iraq, near the Iran border. Um, we are flying and we were over the city. Now this plane is 500 pounds, runs on 110 low out of gas. Um, so volatile that even just stack electricity from your boots will ignite the fumes. So we're close to the end of the mission um, and we got a warning where we lost our flight control system that's the computer of the bird I was flying so I was command of that mission and that aircraft I had the guy operating the camera payload operator flip to the checklist for that command that command literally is pop the chute because the plane has a chute to save the camera. Okay. By the time he started reading off what to do, I was close to hitting cut engine and pop chute. It's a button for cut engine and pop chute. And it's glass cockpit control station. So it's literally blunt buttons on computer screens that you select with the mouse. Not new enough to be touch screen. Um, but still pretty high tech for 1993 when the bird was created. So, right when I start to get ready to go, quick. Um, that went away. I lost all readouts on the engine. I didn't push the button. Payload operator saw I didn't push the button. And that's just as serious as the flight control system, because flight control system handles everything. And, uh, you know, at this point, I'm figuring I'm going to have to deploy the parachute and try to glide the plane or glide the plane from the city far enough to where I won't hurt somebody or kill somebody. So 
So we got to flip to that emergency procedure and a second later, and this all took like 15 seconds. No emergency ever is minutes, it's seconds. Um, we, by the time we flipped to the emergency for no engine readout, everything came back. And then in the master caution, it said warm boot return to RTB as soon as possible. So basically what happened, the computer had done so many things between the heat and running everything, it restarted itself in flight. So we didn't really lose the engine. We didn't really lose the brain. But stupid things happen when computers restart themselves. Um, moral to the story is follow the procedures, follow the checklist. Big thing. No one died. No equipment was destroyed. No crash. I brought that plane home because of my training, following procedure, and following a checklist. That's a million plus dollars. But even though I didn't do anything wrong, I followed every procedure that I was responsible for that could have killed somebody. So please just take the RC flying seriously, especially when it comes to propeller and helicopter stuff. I got scars all over my arms. <laughs> and those were just minor. Um, please take it seriously. Um, and to end on a good note, Jake sprang a lot of crap while I was over there. That was 120 plus where there in the summer. Um, one of the missions we did, um, spent a lot of time just looking at dirt because nothing was going on. And there were some really great times, but it was separated by lots of boredom trying to figure out how am I going to stay awake and stare at peace dirt. Um, we had some seen some warning signs that something funny was going to be going on because we did route recon. We reported it up. Um, of course, my command didn't do anything with it. That's another story. Um, we, uh, a couple, like a week or two later, the other crew that was on witnessed the convoy in the area where we saw the freaky stuff going on, watched the convoy get hit by AED. So that's no good, right? So that's kind of bad to the story. But more of the story is um, from what me and the other guy I flew with all the time saw. And the stuff they saw, the other crew saw before the convoy got hit. Uh, like a week or two after that, we were able to get, not me, because I was the one operating the camera. We were able to get the convoy diverted. Um, and, you know, a couple minutes before the convoy went by the area on the other side of the road. A bunch of people left in cars, so I'm pretty sure something bad would have happened. Um, but we protected that convoy. Like, all they were doing, they weren't going out trying to kill people. They weren't going to try to arrest people. They were trying to provide fuel and food to a special forces outpost that was north of us. But they still wanted to kill an American soldier. So, at the end of the day, we saved someone's life. Can I guarantee there's IED there? No. Probably over 80 percent chance there was a remote controlled IED there that we prevented from being used on the convoy that day. Um, a lot of cool stores from when I deployed. I love aviation. Um, just be careful, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm no expert. Let me tell you. Even having a thousand flight hours in country protecting people, I still am no expert. In fact, when it comes to this RG stuff, especially the flying, oh, I'm no expert, trust me. I've only crashed so far. So, uh, 
amazing at working on stuff, getting it to work right, fixing it, repairing it. So I still have to learn the flying part, but uh, that'll come. So a bunch of shout outs, people, you know, again, Pilot Rare, uh, Robert, Captain Blas, go and check them out. They're great guys. Do have an accent because they're from Slovenia, and so English is not their first language. So sometimes they don't know some words. Um, that by no means does not detract from it. Um, they're two really great guys. Robert had a work accident, almost cut his left hand off, so just be thinking about him and maybe check the channel out. Check out Pilot Robert, Captain Mike, DFRC. He's one of my. So I live on the other side of the country from him. He's probably one of my best friends right now. Uh, both served in the Army, both similar places. Great guy, has a great passion for RC. Again, check out Jeff's Custom RC. He's a great guy. Skip Build RC. Uh, Double Wire RC. He's another veteran. And the more people I meet, surprisingly, the more of them I find out are veterans. So. Uh, there's lots of people that I can't remember right now that deserve a shout out. Um, uh, thanks for being patient with me. By the way, I finished my previous semester last week. C's get degrees. Uh, that test I had to ace to get become a UAV pilot. Yeah, I could not ace it now. I'll tell you that much. But that's PTSD for you. So. Uh, Big shout out to everybody that followed me. Um, big, big shout out. Uh, more coming. If you guys like some of the stories I've shared today, I've got more so I can do some more of that and uh, continue to do the RC stuff. As you can tell, I got cold, probably from the stress of finals last week. So, might not get out flying this week, even though I wanted to. My Kingfisher is ready, but batteries are not charged. My new camera, the Reckham Roy. Oh, there's another really good guy to check out, the Reckham Roy, guys. The camera he recommended is charged or ready, so. Um, uh, otherwise, I this is Eric with Shout Ops RC, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.